it's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the Double Stop Podcast. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I have Stevie Salas. As always, he goes through his entire career and we find out all kinds of cool things about it. Now, I'm struggling with a bit of a cold, so I kind of sound like shit, but I soldiered on, got to interview, and Stevie was great. So let's get right to it, my conversation with Stevie Salas. When I was really, really young, I, uh, my stepfather, my stepfather was a musician, and he, and he was in a really cool rock band in San Diego. And so, I mean, when I was little, like, you know, kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fourth grade. So I spent a lot of time going to his gigs, and uh, I spent also a lot of time listening to Cream and Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix, and because because they, they, uh, that's, what, that's what they listen to in my house. So I was exposed to really, really good music at a really young age. Like I, I learned what FM radio was, you know, and uh, the difference between FM and AM. Because and, my, uh, my hippie stepfather in his rock band, you know, they'd all sit around smoking weed and taking acid. And, and, uh, and uh, we'd go out to the Indian reservation and uh, they'd all, all the kids would run around naked. It was like one of those movies, like watching Billy Jack or something, you know. And all the kids were like all hippied up and naked, naked running around in nature. We did granola and all that same old like, stereotypical shit. And um, so I had a good uh, music education that way. And then, uh, then later I went to live with my real father, and that's when I actually started playing guitar. And how long were you playing before you got into your first band? Oh, uh, not long. I didn't even start playing really until I was 15 years old. And um, it, I... Um, I just, you know, grabbed a guitar and I started playing and I pretty much by the time I was 17, I was already playing at my high school dances and, and parties around town and, and, uh, all over, you know, San Diego. And at what point did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Well, until about 11th grade, you know, I, I loved the ocean and I surfed my whole life and I, and I worked on the fishing boats there in Oceanside in San Diego and, and I, you know, I, I used to take these fishing trips into Mexico and, and I just, you know, surf like everywhere. And I was just, um, you know, just loved the ocean really, you know, it was like a, a great love. And so up to that point, my, my, my thoughts were I was going to join the Coast Guard. I thought I'd oh, get wow. out of high school. Yeah, I thought I'd get out of high school and join the Coast Guard. And I'm being a pretty athletic guy and I played tons of sports all my whole life and I raced motocross and I skateboarded and I did, you know, I, I was, you know, really uh, thinking that was what I was going to do. I joined the Coast Guard and, and, uh, but then the guitar thing kind of came and, and it was really, really easy for me. It was like I was playing and by the time I was 17, you know, I was, to be in high school and to be playing, like all the guys in my band were all older than me. I was the youngest guy in the band. And, uh, you know, we were playing, we played my own high school dances where I'd come back to school on Monday and I was like a hero, you know. So I kind of enjoyed that. You know, we'd play a backyard party and every kid from school and all the local schools were there. I was kind of getting a taste of being this, uh, you know, kind of popular kid. It, it, I, mean, I started playing the backyard parties when I was 11th grade, right? And, uh, and by 12th grade, my band was like really big already in the North County, San Diego. And, uh, I mean, we, we got to where I got out of high school. It was like almost like Duran Duran where we had like girls who would chase us down the street and scream and cry. <laughs> There's photos in my book. There's a photo in my book. I think that's in there. I, I saw where I'm on, I'm on a stage in front of, you know, there's thousands of kids out there and there's just a wall of chicks and one of them diving at my feet. You know what I mean? While I'm playing guitar. <laughs> it's like, it was kind of like weird. It was like instantly we were like this, this, Good looking young group. And I thought to myself, you know, this is pretty good. I, I, I think I'm going to give this a try for a while. And, um, and that, that was sort of my, my thinking that I, I think I could do this. And, and it sort of uh, made sense to me. That's a lot of power for a 17 or 18 year old kid. How did that affect you? It didn't, you know, it was a lot of power, but it was sort of like my eye wasn't on that kind of power. My eye was on the big picture. You know, of course, a recording contract. And, and, um, you know, just doing great music and, uh, and having a, a career, you know, like being a rock star. 
it was like sort of like I, I just saw the future and I saw that this this is going to work out for me. And I kind of just seemed to never really feel insecure about it. I, I just I just kind of knew I was going to you know that it was going to happen for me. Now your guitar style, you clearly were not a, a George Lynch clone <laughs> or whoever was a big guy at that time. Um, yeah. It's very distinct to, uh, style. Where did that come from? Well, here's what happened. Uh, I, and I talk about this in my book as well because I was in a band in San Diego. And in San Diego, we grew up, you know, where I grew up in Oceanside where there's black kids, white kids, you know, purple kids, green kids, whatever. I'm American Indian. You know, we were all just kids. We all surfed. We all skateboarded. We all, you know, we all, you know, it was no, the race was sort of invisible where I grew up. And um, you were either an asshole or you were cool. You know what I mean? It was like, it didn't matter <laughs> yeah. what color you were. And so um, I played, you know, I was, was listening the Parliament Funkadelic, the, the, the kids on my wrestling team in high school would play me Parliament Funkadelic, and they say, this is like the Black Kiss. And I was into Kiss, you know, and I was into Zeppelin. And uh, and then, you know, I, I got it really got into, like, uh, the Ramones, and I got into the police, and I got into uh, Elvis Costello and Joe Jackson. And, and so I equally, I was kind of a weird kid. I equally loved, and, I mean, I could easily listen to Joe Jackson, and I could easily then go put on Led Zeppelin, and I could easily go on then and listen to the Commodores. And it all made sense to me musically. There was either shitty songs or there were great songs. You know what I mean? And and it was about that. So I was a massive Aerosmith fan, and, and, and I was a Led Zeppelin fan, but I really started to realize that Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith were sounding like they were trying to sound black. And and to me, that was awesome, you know? Just recently, <laughs> I mean, a song like uh, Last Child by uh, by Aerosmith is about as funky as it gets, right? And, uh, and you know, and then... You know, just recently I was on, hanging out backstage with Aerosmith and, and, and Steven Tyler says, hey, come sit in with us tonight and play Last Child. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? It's like, that's my jam. I mean, I, I was sitting in my bedroom at 15 years old, Motionside, California, playing to that song. So, yeah, let's do it. So it all made sense to me, you know what I mean? So, so I, I mean, I, I never thought when I was 15 years old in my bedroom playing the Led Zeppelin stuff I'd ever be hanging out with Jimmy Page and Steven Tyler and all the guys that I, Jeff Beck and all the dudes that I know now. But, um, but it all made sense to me. You know what I mean? It's like Jeff Beck was completely, completely, uh, on a whole nother level of being outside. But yet I could really understand what he was doing with Jan Hama, you know? And I was like, I could understand Led Zeppelin. When, when Robert Plant said, take it to the bridge, I never really realized he was just ripping off James Brown. But then I got into James Brown, right? So I got to L.A., and I realized, like you said, there was George Lynch, and there was Bon Jovi, and there was Motley Crue, and there was, uh, you know, my guy was Eddie Van Halen. All the rest of those guys, although George Lynch and, and all those guys are my buddies, um, but I was, they weren't on my radar. It was like I was Eddie Van Halen, and to me, everybody else was sort of like, you know, you had Eddie and you had Jimi Hendrix for me, and, uh, and maybe not Al Rogers because I love this rhythm. So I got to L.A. and I realized, God, you know what? It's like, I am never going to be as good as Eddie Van Halen. I'm never going to be as good as Eddie Van Halen. I just really knew that. I wasn't copying out. I wasn't like being like, you know, I was being realistic. Uh, and I said, um, you know, I don't look like George Lynch and I don't look like, you know, Richie Sambora or the guys in Poison. And, and, and in part the guys on the street, I didn't want to, you know. And, um, and I thought, what? I was playing already at that time with, with, with Was Not Was and, uh, you know, early on with George Clinton in 1985 and Bootsy Collins. And, and, I, and I was like, I'd hang out with the Chili Peppers and I was watching what they were doing. And that, that was kind of working for me, but they were a lot more punk rock than, than me, but they were really into this funk and this mixture. I remember, I remember sitting in the studio, Baby O Studios, where, where I lived when I was homeless and hanging out with, with George Clinton and Bootsy Collins and the Chili Peppers playing rough mixes to, to party on your pussy, and I thought that I remember thinking "Party on Your Pussy" was about the coolest fucking song I'd ever heard. And because the demo, they played us the demos, and the demos were way faster and funkier than the actual album was. Um, and I remember me thinking, "This is amazing." I remember Bootsy Collins going, "No, that's never going to be commercial enough, though." And I'm like, "Who cares?" So I started thinking <laughs> about this thing. I was playing with George and Bootsy and hearing this stuff, and. Uh, and I knew I wasn't going to be as good as George and uh, as, as, as uh, Eddie Van Halen, and I knew I didn't fit the look of an '80s rocker guy. And I thought, what am I going to do to stand out? And that's where I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do. I'm going to play 
music with a funk rhythm, but I'm not going to do it with a clean, funky guitar. I'm going to do the clean, funky riffs with a heavy guitar. And I just thought that's going to be my thing. And uh, that's exact. That's completely what I focused on. I said I have to find something that makes me stand out um, so I don't just be a second-rate one of these other guys, right? And I, and I figured at that, at that point, I really realized that my rhythm... I could hold my own with the best in the world at that if I stayed in that game, right? And uh, that was sort of my plan. That's really interesting to me that your style developed, consciously at least, after you had been playing with George Clinton. What, totally. what was your style at that point then? I kind of got it. See, when I started playing with George, people think, uh, they talk about how funky I am and all this shit. George Clinton wouldn't let me play any rhythm on his records. I played all heavy kit. It was all rock, power chords and freak out solos and dive bombs. Um, so everyone thought I was all this funky guy because of George Clinton. George, George was like, "You ain't playing the, you ain't playing no rhythm with me." Um, you, you know, it's like he had, he had, he had, he had Boogie and he had, he had Gary Scheider. So, but what I got to do is I get to sit in the room and watch those guys play rhythm, and I thought, God, that is just on a whole nother level, man. It's like, when you listen to the intricacies of those kind of rhythm patterns, when you listen to George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic, if you really listen, you're realizing it. It ain't just like a guy going, ding 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 It's like, you know, it's just like insane. And I thought, I thought uh, now, can I do that with my amp plugged into a 100-watt Marshall? If I can do that, with a, with a sound like Eddie Van Halen, I go. I want to have something really unique here. And quite honestly, I, I was I was marketing and thinking of marketing when I when I when I was doing this because I, I knew that if I wanted to make it in L.A., I had to find a way to stand out. And I understood black music because I grew up loving it with my friends in Oceanside, listening to the Commodores and Earth, Wind and Fire, and and but I you know but I also understood rock, you know you, you know listening to Ted Nugent and Aerosmith and and uh, Led Zeppelin and, and the bands I was so into. And I understood this punk rock energy that's really a part of my style that no one ever talks about. You know, because I was really into the Ramones and really into, into, um, I loved Joe Jackson and I loved, uh, uh, Elvis Costello. And so those, so all those three combinations went into one style for me. And, uh, if you listen to even Color Code and you listen to The Heart of the Calmer, there's a punk rock energy that's there. And I think that's what's, I think that that's what's sustained me all these years is that, and it's also maybe what stopped me from making it super big is I always I kind of had this street energy to my playing, which has given me a thing where kids respect me and love my playing. It keeps me going. But it also, in a way, it was a little too maybe alternative or dirty to ever fit on a radio format, you know? It works from everywhere else in the world. It's just not in America. And that's been virtually your entire career. Uh, has been other parts of the world. You, you know, you can hear it though. If you listen to Sass Jordan Rats, which I, you know, I wrote and produced that whole record, and, and uh, with Sass, and I mean, my, I mean, I'm digging in on that record like with a lot of attitude. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, oh yeah, it's 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 got an energy to it that's very street. You know. It's interesting because I'm based out of Canada and we've never had a problem getting your records. For the most part, there's a few kind of in the late 90s that were Japan, European only, but in Canada, your stuff is pretty readily available, but not at all in the States. No, I know. It's crazy, right? But here's what happened. I signed with EMI in Canada. And so I had a deal. And to tell you the truth, I really screwed up. I, I got really hot when Back from the Living came out. I mean, globally, I was signing these multi-million dollar contracts and um, I didn't have a deal for it in the States. And in Canada, a label called, um, what were they called? It started with an M. Um, it was a big label in Canada for a long time. It started with an M. I forget the name right now. They offered me a deal for Back for the Living and it, I didn't feel it was enough money and I didn't take it. And... I, I, I was getting ready to do this huge deal in the United States. I wanted to keep Canada open because this huge radio promotion guy heard my song Start Again, and it, which was blowing up in Japan and around you know those parts of the world. And he said, this is a hit record. 
And I thought, you know what? Somebody finally gets me. And Start Again was just happening with alternative music, and I was rocking up, and it was alternative. Up, and this radio guy, um, big time radio guy, um, who was who people paid a fortune for to promote their records. He was going to sign me to his own personal company. He was going to promote Start Again and get you know. And I was going to do no. I was going to be it. I was going to blow up in America. It was 1994, 95, and this was going to be it. And so I didn't do the deal in Canada, and. Um, what happened was when I was going to meet the guy in LA, I gave a call. I had a Monday meeting and I called the office and his secretary was all distraught. And it turns out that this guy was murdered by his girlfriend that weekend at a beach house. Cause he was a guy who was a real ladies man. And I'm blanking on his name right now, but he was a legend. He was a, he was a, he was a Hollywood legend. Matter of fact, they made a documentary about this guy. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. It's driving me crazy. Maybe you'll research it. Um, he was the hugest radio promotion guy. Worked at A and M, and he he broke all the bands. And 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 I and I thought, oh my god, you know, here's this guy that I've known forever because I knew him when I was in Prince Trent Barbie. I knew him when I was doing all these other big gigs because he was all, all the big acts. He was the guy in charge of radio. And here's this guy that believes in my song, and I'm gonna. This is gonna change my life, and all my dreams are gonna come true in America. And then, and then and the guy gets murdered and by, his, by, by his girlfriend who caught him with another girl and she shot him and, uh, in Malibu. Charlie, his name was Charlie Minor. And I was just like, I, I'm cursed. It's like somebody doesn't ever want me to make it in America. I don't know what, the, what it is. And at that point, I'd already passed on the deal in Canada. Otherwise, Back from the Living would have came out in Canada on a label there, and you would have and you would have heard about it the same way, you know, made my other records, um, you know, some of my other records. You know, I had a pretty good run with Electric Pow Wow up there, and I had a, I sold a lot of Electric Pow Wows, and I sold a lot of Color Codes. Color Code was almost a gold album up there. In the um, in the Sass Jordan Rats CD, there's a little question mark right in the in the hole through the CD. And if you pull it out and you pull out the slip case underneath, there's an advertisement for Pow Wow. Oh, there is? They're both on Aquarius. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It was the coolest thing. That's how I discovered it myself. Oh, uh, Donald K. Donald. That's Donald K. Donald. For he was the guy who owned Aquarius. Let, let's go back a touch to... I'm still trying to wrap my head around how a 19 or 20-year-old kid who hasn't found his style even ends up in a studio with George Clinton and Bootsy Collins. How does that even, how do you even get, that's a big leap for me. Well, it's, it's really a famous story. There's a documentary that's being made right now for PBS, and, um, and I'm in it. It's about Native Americans who, who broke through in, in, in sort of, uh, of um, it's about this small group of Native Americans that's inspired, you know, a lot of uh, uh, what's, that sort of helped shape pop music history. And you didn't necessarily know it, you know. Uh, guys like uh, Jesse Ed Davis, who played with all four Beatles, and he influenced Aerosmith, and he influenced uh, the sound of uh, Allman Brothers. And, you know, I was included in this piece. It was in the Smithsonian, actually. And then um, I'm in the film as well. And all these musicians like Phil X and people are talking about how I influenced all of them, them, I guess. And, and um, the thing is, is it happened was, is that I was homeless. And, and George Clinton tells this story in the movie. That's why I was telling you about the movie. Um, I was homeless at, in August of 1985. I was living in a house in LA and I got kicked out. I couldn't live there anymore. And um, a studio called Baby O Recording Studios in Hollywood. Um, my friend David O from a band called The Plimsolls worked there and he liked me. And a guy called Rick, Rick Parada, Rich per, uh, Rick Parada owned the studio and he invented Matchless Amps and he liked me. So they let me sleep on the couch in, in exchange for running, uh, cleaning up and running their rehearsal studio. And then I'd go sleep at the recording studio because I didn't know where to go. And, you know, I'd still pull the paper from there and milk. <laughs> you know, it was like, I was starving. I lost 25 pounds during that year of 1985 when I was living in L.A. I mean, I was like, it was like do or die. But at the time, you're a kid, you don't give a shit, right? It's like, who cares? Um, so I, um, they let me sleep on their couch. And while in the studio, I met Keo and uh, I met Gene Simmons and Vinnie Vincent. And all these guys were making records there. And I'd go up to all these different guys. I'd be like, 
you know, hey, if you ever need someone to play guitar, you know, I play guitar. And, you know, everybody was like, you know, fuck off. You know, get out of here, kid. <laughs> and, and, and it was like, but I made friends with, like, all the engineers. And and uh, and I kept my amp and my guitar there. And one day, George Clinton came in the studio. And I had been working with this crazy acid house uh a Fairlight programmer guy named Zio who knew George Clinton. So I said, Hey, I play with Zio. Um, and so I'm here. And if you ever need any guitar, you know, please, uh, you know, let me know. I'll be happy to play. And, and, and David Spradley and George Clinton both said, yeah, sure. Whatever. Cool. They're actually cool. And, um, that night George Clinton was in the studio and he had a guy, a guy named Jack Sherman who was, um, playing some guitar for him. Jack Sherman was then the guitar player for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And um, I guess Jack Sherman couldn't give him what he needed. And uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, they woke me up and they asked me if I'd come in and play. And um, I went in there and George Clinton and I plugged in. There, there was a whole... Gene Simmons was producing Keel. And there was this like about 20 Marshall amps all blocked off and they had yellow do not touch tape all over them. And uh, me and George plugged into all those amps and turned them all up and we just did it anyways. Like even though we weren't supposed to touch them. And, uh, and I lit up, I, I went crazy. I just knew that George Clinton was really outside and really crazy. And I just lost my mind on the guitar and I did everything that I thought freak out wise that might get his attention. And, and he came running into the studio, going, what's going on in here? And he goes, it sounds like a free train going through the room. And, uh, he, and he um, um, stood next to me and, and just started rocking with me. And he'd yell at me, you know, play some blues. And I'd play some blues. It's, I mean, the songs were 10 minutes long, man. You know, it was from the R&B Skeletons in the Closet album. And he'd go, play some funk. And I'd play like some funk. Okay, play some, some metal. <laughs> play some metal. You know, I was just doing all these different styles in the middle of these songs. And uh, he just liked me. And he let me start hanging out with him. And... Uh, and I got paid from Capitol Records a session, and, and that's how my career started. And everybody then thought I was his guitar player. Nobody realized I was some homeless kid living in the studio. You got to fake it till you make it, I guess, eh? Well, you know what I mean? You got to get lucky is what it is. You got to get lucky. I got lucky. And then I met Bootsy, and Bootsy knew exactly my story. But Bootsy liked me because Bootsy, saw, Bootsy told, said to everyone, and he said this in the film too, that I reminded him of him when he was a kid, and he saw himself in me. And he took me under his wing. And then Bootsy would come to my house. Like I was living, by this time I moved out of the studio, I was living in the guest house of uh, Terry Costa, Nika Costa's mom. So I used to babysit Nika, and I was living in their guest house in Beverly Hills in this mansion. And because um, uh, Terry met me and thought I was a cool kid, and she rented it to me for super cheap. And so Bootsy would come over. I mean, it, it, was, like, it was like crazy, right? Um, and these guys sort of all nurtured me. How did you end up getting into a band with Bootsy then for hardware? Well, that was a long time later. Then what happened was, this was 86, 87. Um, I did Bootsy's album called the What's Bootsy Doing for Sony. Okay? And then, ironically, that's how I ended up doing Was Not Was. Because I went, Bootsy was signed to Sony, and Don Was, they were talking about Don Was producing a Bootsy track. So Bootsy and I went to the meeting at Sony together. And Don Was heard my four-track demos of some songs I was working on for Bootsy and called me up and asked me if I'd come play on the Was Not Was album. And then it turns out I ended, I ended up producing a track with Don on the Was Not Was album. And Don, you know, so here Don was meeting Bootsy to produce Bootsy. I ended up going to the meeting. I ended up producing Don Was with Don Was. You know what I mean? It's weird. And, uh, and then, you know, out of the blue, the Walk the Dinosaur becomes a number one hit. And uh, by this time, I'm doing Bootsy's What's Bootsy Doing album. And then I, uh, I join Rod Stewart, and I get signed to Island. And then Bill Laswell produces my first album for um, Color Code. And Bill Laswell also had produced Bootsy Collins, so Bill Laswell you know, knew me. So later on, after Color Code, I was trying to figure out my... I wanted to do my second Color Code album, and Bill Laswell was going to produce that one. And I was actually in Toronto and staying at Jeff Healy's house, writing songs and working on the Jeff Healy album with Jeff Healy and the Jeff Healy band. And I got a phone call. From, I got a phone call from uh, Bill Laswell from New York, and he says, "Hey, man, we're going to do your new album, but Buddy Miles is going to play drums." And uh, 
So Bootsy and I had already been talking. And Bootsy said he was going to do the second Color Code album because we were going to do some crazy shit. He, Bootsy wanted a chance to really rock, right? And so, okay, so Bootsy was going to do the Color Code album. And then Laswell called me and said, you got to use Buddy Miles. And I'm like, what? I go, I go, does Buddy Miles even know how to play anymore? Because I hadn't seen him right anyway. And, and he goes, who cares? He goes, awesome. He goes, just do it. And I didn't want to do it, but then Bootsy Collins said, are you crazy? He goes, you, you, you're going to have, do a record in your rhythm section. Little kid, you is going to have me on bass and Buddy Miles from the band of gypsies on drums. He goes, are you crazy? You got to do it. So I was like, okay. Um, so we showed up in New York and, um, it was supposed to be the second color code album. But what happened was we started playing all the songs I'd written for the second Color Code album, which many of them ended up on Pow Wow or on, uh, or on um, Back From the Living. And I realized that none of the songs were really going to work. Um, they just didn't sound right with Buddy Miles. But the, with Buddy Miles, there was a whole big, deeper, heavier, crazy thing going on. And uh, so we sat in the studio and we wrote all songs on the spot and recorded and wrote them on the spot and just did it like old school. And uh, we we couldn't call it Stevie Saw's Color Code, so we 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 called it a band. We called it Hardware. Originally, it was called Third Eye Open, and the record was called Hardware uh, for Japan. And but when it when it came out in America on Record Disc, it became Hardware, and the album was Third Eye Open. Now for Pow Wow, I think it's become fairly common since then to have this long list of musicians come in and kind of half covers, half originals, kind of blend. But at the time, it wasn't. Let it be known, I was the guy who started that fad. If you think about it, yeah. And, and but it wasn't a it wasn't an intention. What happened was the record company was wearing me out, wanting the second Color Code album. They were in a hurry for it, and it wasn't. I just couldn't finish it. Electric Power took me four years. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, Back from the Living took me four years to make. It was a really hard album for me. And I tell your story, walk in and all these things. It was, it was, a, it was a whole new thing I was getting into. It but really of detail and of. Uh, um, and it was hard. And, I mean, who's, nobody sounded like Born to Mac. Nobody sounded like, you could say some people might have sounded a little bit Pat Travers Band or whatever, sounded like, that, like, uh, like Tell Your Story Walking. But, you know, it Start Again didn't sound like anybody else. It had a bit of Nirvana, but it had a funk in it. You know, it had, you know, Born to Mac didn't sound like anybody. You know what I mean? I, I was once there. Uh, I once was there, it was like, not, nobody sounded like that. I was really trying to create something original and, and unique and that would, that would be something really special. And, I, and the record company was like, hurry up and finish, and I couldn't finish. So what I did was I had a lot of leftover songs that I knew wasn't going to make it on the back from the living. Um, so I stuck those songs, and then I, I decided to record a bunch of cover tunes. With, and, and instead of just recording cover tunes, I... I I have a you know I have a long list of really powerful music business friends and I got them all to come play with me you know I did a rockabilly song with Slim Jim from the Stray Cats and I did a you know uh, I had Zach Wild come and rock on some old Rick Derringer with me and I had Cheap Trick play with me on some you know and Fast Jordan and I just got my friends to come in and jam jam with me and I could I did it quickly and and and, and cheaply like I I was uh, in the studio with Terrence Trent Darby. And Matt Swarm was hanging out with Terrence Trent Darby and Zach Wild and, and, and Cheap Trick was in the studio next door. So I literally booked the studio. I went into the room and I, and I got Matt to play drums and Tom Peterson from Cheap Trick to play bass. And I just cut tracks, you know, like for fun. And Electric Power was that. It was just me and a bunch of my friends jamming, having fun. And I knocked the record out very quickly before I went on tour with Duran Duran and, uh, and put that record out so the record companies would, would leave me alone for a little while longer so I could finish back from the living. And did that break and that creative juices, did that get you going again? Yeah, it, it, gave, me a more, it gave me a little bit of space uh, to, to keep working on back from the living. Well, you got to realize, at that same exact time, I did. I wrote the Hardware album and recorded that. I wrote uh, several Sash Jordan hits from her Racine album and cut those. I wrote the whole Vats album with Sass and cut that. And did Clarence Trent Darby and I did uh, Jeff Healy, and I did um, the Pow Wow album, and almost the Back from the Living album, all in a period of about two years. I was knocking, I was so hot. I was, my brain, I was so creative then. I was just, I was on fire. And I was Terrence Trent Darby's musical director. I was Sash Jordan's producer. And I was, you know, got, and plus I was playing on all kinds of other people's records as well. So, I mean, it was just an incredible time. I was just, you know, yeah, I was just on fire, you know. And how did you hook up with, with Sass? Um, she was my girlfriend. 
I met her through my A and R guy. He, he was a huge fan of hers, and um, she came down from Canada when when Tell Somebody was out, and we met at my Island Records Christmas party. And her and I just fell in with each other. We were just like kindred spirits, and we're still like brother and sister. We're like the best of friends still to this day. But uh, yeah, we were dating each other. Um, and having a really good time and working on music and we wrote You Don't Have to Remind Me and we wrote, wrote I Want to Believe and and um, and it was sort of like, uh, you know, then she went on her tour and I took off on mine and, you know, but we stayed really close. It's like, we're literally like family. You know, her family and her husband and all of us now, we're all still really, really close. It seems every now and then you still play. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I can't, you know, if I, if I have the time and, and, and place... Sass and I talk all the time. We'd love to get, we'd love to get the original band, the original rap band back together with Taylor Hawkins and, and uh, me and uh, Sass and, you know, get out and do some stuff. That'd be really fun. Oh, yeah. That was a shit-hot band. Yeah, thank you. Around that same time, <clears throat> maybe a couple years later, uh, you had Nickelback with, with Bernard. Yes. And he was also on Pow Wow as well. So there's, there's a history there. Where did that start from? Well, Bernard sang on the Hardware album. That's where I met him. And I knew about Bernard Fowler. Everybody knew about Bernard Fowler. He was already a legend, you know what I mean? He'd been working with the Stones, and he was, you know, producing Ronnie Wood, and he was doing, you know, Herbie Hancock and Philip Glass, and he was a legend, you know? And uh, he, came in the, he came in and sang on the Hardware album with me, and him and I just really became friends. And I was in town playing Madison Square Gardens in 1993 um, while I was, no, I, I can't, yeah, I, I was, I was, no, I was in England uh, doing television shows with Terrence Trent Darby for about a month. And um, while I was knocking out those TV shows, I was trying to finish Electric Pow Wow. And, um, so I got a hold of Bernard and I said, Bernard, I want to do a cover of my, one of my favorite songs from the 70s called The Groove Line. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, I go, will you sing it for me? He said, yeah. And so on the way back from, to L.A. from London, I, I stopped in New York City and I booked this, uh, the Beastie Boys had this really cool lo-fi studio with like all old gear in it. And so I called P.M. Stevens and I called Brian Tishy and uh, I said, meet me in, at the studio. And uh, Bernard came by. And we cut um, the Parliament Funkadelic song, Good to Your Ear Hole. And we cut, um, but uh, Bernard didn't sing that one, but we cut that. And then we cut uh, the groove line all on the same day. And um, we, um, Bernard came in and we sang the groove line and, and that was that. It was all good. And uh, I put out Pow Wow and the groove line went to number three on the charts in Japan. It was like a huge hit. And I was like, holy shit. Yeah, so I called Bernard, and I said, hey, Bernard, I go, I go, man, this song is a fucking smash, dude. And he's like, really? I go, yeah, I go, you know, we should think about doing some more stuff together. And, and at that time, um, I had record companies offering me to create, create projects. Like, they, they said, like, if you could do a project uh, with a singer, who would you do one with? And they, they were trying to create, get me to create, like, some kind of super band, right? And I... Um, I thought, um, I keep saying I want to do one with Bernard Fowler. And the record company, you know, all said Bernard Fowler's a legend, but everybody knew that uh, to have a black lead singer in a rock record was, you know, it, it sucks, but it was, it was completely an uphill battle because call it what you want, man, there's still massive amounts of racism at rock radio. You know what I mean? I was actually on a, on the, on a secret phone call with a head of uh, radio, a friend of mine, who called some programmers uh, up, and, uh, and, and they were listening to the Nickelback song, Love Song, before it came out. Because uh, all, uh, all these record companies were trying to decide if they would sign me or not. Because uh, I had this development deal with Warner Brothers, with a Warner label. And um, I actually heard a guy say, yeah, it's awesome. This song is amazing. He goes, but do you think there's enough room at rock radio for two bands with a black singer? Because Living Color is already on the air. I couldn't believe my, I couldn't believe my ears that I actually was hearing this. And and I and when I told Bernard Fowler, it, it made him cry it, it, because his dream was to be a rock singer and and just to be great. And 
and that news broke his heart. And, and, and you know, it was just so depressing. And, and, and I, I was then more determined than ever to, 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 to figure this out. You know, I always had, I had a black drummer in color code. I, had, I didn't do it on purpose because like, I'm trying to be like super cool with all these races. It was just like, I liked the, what these different cultures brought to the sound you know, mixed together. It was like, there was something different about it. Each guy's approach was a little bit different, you know? And, uh, and so then I said, fuck this, I'm doing Nickelback. And, uh, Warner Brothers wouldn't sign us because of it. And so I, what happened was, what happened was back from the living at this time now had exploded in Asia. It was the biggest record in Japan. I mean, I'm going there and I'm selling 10,000 tickets and, 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 I, everything sold out. I'm getting mobbed in the street, getting my hair pulled out by girls. It was just like, it was like I was like an instant superstar. It was really weird because I come home to LA and people just knew me as Stevie Silas. But in Japan, I couldn't walk down the street. I could, it was crazy. And, uh, so at that particular time, I, I my rec- my recording contract became free and my manager, uh, my managers at the time got me into this huge bidding war. And I signed this gigantic multi-million dollar contract where I owned my own masters, I got my own label, and I got, you know, millions of dollars. It was amazing. And and cash, they were giving me cash. It was like, you know, all of a sudden I get a, you know, (laughs) a half a million dollars cash wired into my account. It was like unbelievable. And it was, it was just for Asia. And, uh, so part of that deal was I got to have my own label and, um, I said, the first record I want to release is Nickelback. And um, I put Nickelback out on my label in Japan, and uh, Hot Song for Nowhere went right to the top of the charts. It was just huge. And uh, then, you know, and then I spent a lot of years, me and Bernard, you know, beating the bushes, you know, trying to make uh, Nickelback happen in America. And it was happening in some cities, and, you know, Love Song was a like, number one on the radio in Tampa. Uh, and I'm sorry, in, in Orlando, and we'd go to Orlando and sell 3,000 tickets. Then we'd go down the street in Tampa and sell, you know, 60 tickets. It was just really, really crazy. It was really hard. But it, I was determined to try to make this work. Uh, I, I just didn't want to hear, I just refused to hear that good music couldn't trump, you know, race. Uh, but getting past corporate radio, which was getting tighter and tighter, it was just, it just seemed like a, a, a never-ending uphill battle, and it still is to this day. Now, for the American cover of 12 Hits and a Bump, you guys are all covered in, in some kind of face paint. Was that influenced by your struggles? Yeah, no, what, what, that was a deliberate plan. Um, we were in New York doing the photo shoot for the album cover, and um, I remember when I was really young, my manager was Bill Graham, a guy, a guy, a guy called Morty Wiggins. Managed myself, and he managed the Dan Reed Network, and he managed Ivan Neville. And Ivan put out a record called "If My Ancestors Could See Me Now," which sounded like a pop rock record, reminiscent maybe even to Huey Lewis or something, right? It, but you'd think Ivan Neville from the Neville Brothers would be like, like, like some New Orleans funk, but it wasn't. It was like he made this really great rock pop album, and so they deliberately would not put his picture on the album cover because they didn't want radio to see that he was a, that he was black. They wanted them to listen to the song. So this is a great song, add the song. And then they figured out later, Oh wait, this isn't a white guy. This is a black guy. Um, a black Creole guy, the boot. And, uh, I remember that hit me really hard. I was listening to that meeting and I said, God, that makes a lot of sense. And it sucks that you got to do that. So when we were doing Nickelback, I thought back to that 1989 and that meeting in San Francisco about Ivan Neville's album cover. And I said, paint, it was my idea. I said, I want, I told the photographer, I want me and Bernard's faces painted silver. That way anyone looks at this album cover, you can't tell if I'm black, if I'm American Indian, if I'm green, if I'm purple. You can't tell where I'm, you know what I mean? And you can't tell Bernard. Then you're forced to look at us, and it's compelling because you can see our eyes and our face, and there's something intense about it. But you can't tell, so therefore you won't make a judgment on what the music sounds like based on our skin color. And then inside you got the painting by Ron Wood, which is cool that, too. That was so awesome. That was, that, that, you know, that was Bernard and Ronnie Wood are like, like almost like father and son. So uh, Ronnie did that purely for Bernard. 
you know, it, it was, uh, I saw that painting for sale in an art show recently and it was like 20 grand. I was like, damn. And you guys still play, don't you? You and Bernard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We play all over the world still. We call ourselves the international motherfuckers because there's a group of us like, you know, like <laughs> Steve Jordan and Charlie Drayton and Ivan Neville and, and uh, it's a group of us guys that all grew up in the last 25 years and kind of fancy ourselves to be a little bit like, uh, you know, we, we our own private little group. Like Ivan Neville said it this way. He says, you know, it's like the, it's like the, like the mobster is kind of like, you know, hey, he's a friend of mine. Uh, you know, he's one of us. He's like, he's a, he's, he's one of us. He's a good fella. You know, it's like our own group of musicians. So like, I got to go to Keith Richards' birthday party and Keith would ask Bernard and ask Ivan, who is this guy? Is he cool? And I said, yeah, he's cool. So since <laughs> he said I was cool, I was able to come in. You know what I mean? It's like a private group where you nice. get to hang in the inner circle with these kind of guys where just normal people can't. And, uh, so we, we call us, you know, the international motherfuckers. And, uh, we tour with that and whoever's free to come with us. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we go jam. Guys like Dave Abersees and we'd love Brian Tissue to get out with us more. It's tough because Brian, you know, I, I, I found Brian. Brian was living in my, my Hollywood Hills house when, you know, his first professional recording was Sash Jordan Rats. So that was before <clears throat> Zach Wild, right? He was living in my house when he got the gig with Zach. What it was, was he did Back from the Living and he did, he did Sash Jordan Rats for me and then got the gig with, uh, Zach. He, um, in fact, he, um, his first ever recording, professional recording, was High Road Easy. That was his first professional session. And that song, you know, had 150 ads at radio in week one or something like that. It was huge. Oh, it was definitely massive in Canada. It was a huge song when that came out. It was big in America, too, that was. In the mid-90s, you were doing something again that became commonplace later on, but at the time it was quite unique and it got a little confusing, but you were licensing your records to a lot of different places. And, and so they were coming out with different names and it, it got a little confusing for the fans, but now that's commonplace. People do that all the time, but it was very unique back then. How did can that come about? Can we just make sure some of these things that I did early on, when I'm dead, I get credit for it for like, you know, I just, <laughs> I just knew that, you know, what was going on. And the reason I did that is because I had these different licensing deals all over the world. And so I wasn't selling tons of records, but I was selling enough records, but I was richer than all my friends because I was getting paid directly as a record company owner per territory. Meaning like when I did a deal with Island, let's say I get $200,000 for the world. Okay. Well now I was getting that same 200 and something thousand dollars just for France. And I was getting another, you know, hundred thousand for England, and another, I don't know, three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand for for Japan and you know and Korea, and so so I was getting rich, and and uh, what was happening was the problem was is for the fans was is that the records were coming out like Back from the Living came out in ninety four in Japan, but it came out in ninety seven or something like that or ninety eight in. Uh, America, and it came out, you know, maybe six in England or something, you know, it was all over the place. And so the, what was going on was that these guys were selling my imports. You'd find my import records and they were $75 a record. Okay. Well, I was still, I was still getting, I was still getting my $2 a record while these importers were making $20 an album on me and $30 an album on me. And my fans were the ones that were paying the price and it, and it pissed me off. So what I started doing was I started creating different track listings and different covers for different territories so fans could get their own version of the record and then if they wanted to collect the other versions, they could. See, it was a problem with the importers. So if the importers had imported in, you know, 20,000 copies of uh, the Japanese Back from the Living and I put out a record that had the same cover and I said, I'm going to lose 20,000 in sales so the record company would be like, we're fucked. You know, and uh, and I go, yeah, this isn't good. So I put out a different version for that country, uh, with a different cover, and different songs, maybe different mastering, and that way that country and that record company and those fans can get their own unique version of the album without having to pay, you know, a fortune for the imports as well. In two thousand one, uh, for Shapeshifter, you had a song called "Punk Ass Bitch." Yeah, which was aimed at the media. What happened at that point? How did How did you know that? I don't know. I I read it somewhere. I've been following your career for a long time. Yeah, well, it's so true. If you really listen, if you really read the lyric, I mean, you can tell. I'm talking about 
writers. What happened was, it wasn't anything to do with music writers, because to tell you the God's honest truth, music, music writers have kept me alive for 25 years. You know what I mean? I, the press for some, has always seemed to be on my side, thank God. Um, but what happened was, I had a, my, my girlfriend died in 2000. And uh, she committed suicide. And, and it was in my beach house in L.A. And it was the most awful time of my life. And uh, all of a sudden, I became tabloid, like, you know, news. Um, oh, bad boy rocker, you know, cheats on his girlfriend and she commits suicide. And uh, it, they were painting me out to be a real, like, this, it was like I was like, they were trivializing my girlfriend's death in, in this sort of, sensational way that was making me sick. I was in Us Weekly and they were ripping me to shreds. Uh, you know, Stevie's a, you know, just a bad guy, fucking him and his girlfriends and he wouldn't let, and Stevie, you know, uh, Mariah Carey, my girlfriend worked for Mariah Carey, she was a stylist, and uh, Mariah Carey worked too hard and Stevie cheated on her and left her for another woman and, and that's why she killed herself. They, they, they were using me and Mariah Carey and sensationalizing the story about my girlfriend's death. And and then and then all my all these guys are coming out of the woodwork that you, you know my that, like my girlfriend's ex from years and years before me he uh, he's talking to us weekly and, and making up stories and lies about me that weren't true um, you know saying uh, saying things that saying things in the magazines that I didn't do that were lies you know Stevie had plastic surgery and Stevie did this I mean it was horrible and. And, and, and I was in the depths of hell because, you know, I loved my girlfriend very much and this was going on and I was, I was really just down and I had to write a story about this fucking, these, you know, Us Weekly and People Magazines and all these magazines that were like, that's all they do is they just, they write the shit, you know, and, and when people are in their worst and, and then you get people to gossip and, and now it's gotten to the point where it's just ridiculous the way our culture is with how this stuff works, right? It's like, you know, the whole country is, you know, the whole United States is all Jerry Springer central. And, um, punk ass bitch was written about those writers and, and, and those people who were saying those things about me in the press that weren't true. It's like, I wanted to fucking, I like, I'm, I'm old school. I want to meet him in an alley and beat the fuck out of him or let's, you know, <laughs> let's get it on. And, uh, and, yeah. uh, I had to, I was forced to, to deal with this and it was really awful. You know, and people read that stuff and as much as it was r ridiculous, Bernard Fowler told me that people saw the thing uh, in Us magazine about me and they asked him, wow, I read that about Stevie. Is that true? And Bernard would say like, are you kidding? You know him. It's not true. Of course it's not. But people actually kind of started believing it. And, uh, I took, I needed to get away and I took off to Africa and I, you know, and I disappeared for a while and I, and I was just so down and out. And, and so Punk Ass Bitch was all about those writers that, that were preying on people at, at, at their lowest point and how low that was. And, um, Punk Ass Bitch to me is, just, it's the heaviest song and the riff is heavy and the music's heavy and, and it's, it's to me, you know, it sucks because it's one of my, I think it's one of my best records ever made. And, but I, I have a hard listening to it because it reminds me of such a bad time in my life. Was it at all cathartic though to to do it? No, it just fed into more anger. It was more just getting it out. I had to get it out. But uh, like, I can't listen to the Shapeshifter album to this day because it's the angriest album I've ever made. There's very little hope in that album. It's a depressing album. It's heavy, and it, I, I made it so heavy, and I made the guitars are so acidy and so mid range. You know, I was just cranking more mid range, the more I could irritating the tone it was like it was like if you listen to that it's really aggressive and it's really aggressive with soul blasters i would categorize that as ambitious like that was a big record was that on purpose to go from such a dark angry record to just make this as complex as you could yeah i am um, i didn't know what to do to tell you the god's honest truth i had no more color code in me i had no more I didn't know what I wanted to do, and um, I was experimenting. The Soul Blaster record was a straight-up experimental record. That's why I called it Soul Blasters of the Universe. It was like a concept album. Um, and um, I was just experimenting again. I, I've always tried to do records to, to influence people and break new ground 
and, and I've suffered for it because often those records aren't accepted. Like, it's weird, you know, the, the Alternative album was huge in 1995 in Japan, but it didn't get popular in Europe until 1997 or 98, you know, four years later. You know, people didn't like mm. People didn't like Alternative in Europe when they were listening to Back from the Living. And then they grew to love Alternative about four years after the fact. It was weird. So I started touring the Alternative record, which was called Viva La Noise in Europe, um, years after it came out in Japan. So, you know, Soul Blasters was... I mean, I don't know if anyone even gets that record still to this day. I mean, it's a weird record, but, you know... Um, oh, that's funny. That's my favorite record. <laughs> oh, is it Really? Yeah, I love that record. That's so cool. You know, there you go. So I haven't listened to it in a long time. You know, 10,095 was, uh, was you know, about the three years that, that in between my girl's death and, and that record. Um, because 10,095 is, you know, th- that's exactly three years to the day. How many days in three years? And those, and that, that, rec- that song and that shit is about... Th- those three years between the 2000 and... and uh, and when I did the Soul Blasters, was the longest three years of my life. And and uh, and you know, one thousand ninety five is the days that I just survived. That's what it says. Canada seems to return to your life after that again, where you start doing a Canadian TV show. You've got a distribution deal again with Arbor, which again ties back to the TV deal. What is it again with Canada that, that keeps you coming back up? I don't know, man. Canada has been good to me. Um, I'm going to Canada tomorrow. You know, it's, um, Canada, I don't know what it is. People have asked me that for the last 20 years. You know, I had great, great luck with the Healy. And as a matter of fact, Jeff Healy's manager, man of Marshall, Jeff Healy's manager, uh, who was the drummer of Jeff Healy, he lives in the Hollywood Hills house now. It's his house now. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah. <laughs> Stephens, that's my Hollywood Hills house is now his house. Uh, you know, I, uh, I had great runs with him, great runs with Sass. You know, I, I did do some writing and some working with Colin James years ago and stayed at his house. That never saw the light of day too bad because we did a couple of really great songs. Um, and, uh, you know, the television stuff in Canada. And, you know, I have two, two television shows going in Canada. And, I, and my, my PBS movie I'm making now is the main production companies out of Canada, out of Montreal. So... I don't know what it is with me in Canada. Canada's been really good to me. Now, uh, Set It On Blast is your last proper solo record, correct? Yes. No, Jam Power. Jam Power was a covers album like Electric Power too, but Set It On Blast was the last like color code sort of style album, yeah. I know it got released in Japan, but that one I never really saw anywhere else. I didn't release Jam Power, Set It On Blast. I didn't release any of them anywhere else because I, I let Arbor Records put out a few things and that uh, and I realized that they were just collecting money off me and not paying me any royalties or doing any accounting. And I was just getting, I was sick of it. I was like, you know, suck this, man. I'm going to hold on to these tracks. And, and if, if, you know, I hope that my tracks stand the test of time. I'm doing a new deal right now with all my catalog with Spotify. And how's that then? Because I don't hear, I, I hear a lot of artists complain about Spotify. So, so what's this new deal going to be like then? Eh, you know what? I'm going to lose my ass. It's like, let's face it. I've given up. <laughs> I've given up. I, you know, for me now, it's all about legacy. I've given up trying to make money off my records. I mean, I'll get paid, but I mean, what am I going to make? You know, as usual, the, the, the importers, everybody's always made a ton of money off me. You know what I mean? But I can't really complain because I, somehow after 20-something years, I still, you know, I'm not popular really anymore, and people don't really know me. Uh, as much and young kids maybe are young kids are starting to discover me which is really exciting for me to if they hear like some kids like told me the other day kick back's my favorite song it's my number one play on my ipod and oh, that's cool. I, like kick back i go how old are you and he's like, i go that song's older than you you know tell your story walk and still has like legs of its own you know my dream would be that one day some of those songs are going to end up in some big movie soundtracks and not, my my whole catalog will explode and people will say god how did we miss this guy but the fact still remains that it's been five years since set it on blast. When are we going to get some new music? Well, you, you know, I haven't, I've had a lot of people always ask me for that, but I mean, I haven't had a real reason because it's like when you put a record out, the, set it on blast, for instance, I put it out and no, you know, nobody promotes it. Nobody spends any money on, you know, press. And it's almost like you put, it's almost like you're making children. Okay. Your songs are your children and you're, you're, 
you're making children and, and putting them on the street with no clothes and no chance for a, for a wonderful life. And it's heartbreaking, you know. When I hear some shitty song and I think, God, you know, you know, Get Your Hands in the Air should be a bigger song than it is. And, uh, and then, you know, then you think maybe it isn't as good as you think because I'm not, in, I, you know, I'm not getting fucking millions of hits on YouTube either. So I start to think, well, maybe, you know, I just, maybe I've ran my course. I just don't know. I've seen Richie Kotzen, uh, who you have a long history with, yeah, uh, do that. the power trio thing, much like Mike hardware the power trio thing and have success and and george lynch teamed up with doug pinnock and ray luzier and have had i think some surprising success with that one too yeah is that a format you would consider coming back to some kind of super group power trio i would sure um the thing is this though i have a six-year-old son now seven-year-old now he just turned seven and richie's on the road now see richie was home raising his daughter Richie was my neighbor in Hollywood, okay? One of my best friends. 20 years, best pals, and him and I are like brothers. Richie had a daughter, got married, and all those years where you didn't hear about Richie too much, he was home. I was touring fucking 200 dates a year all over Europe and all over Asia. I was out there playing, right? Richie wasn't. Now Richie's daughter's older. Now Richie's touring probably 250 dates a year. Rich is living on the road right now. He wrote me yesterday from Europe, or two days ago. He was emailed me from Europe. Um, I don't want to go play two, 250 dates a year right now. I want to be home with my son, you know? And uh, I didn't wait this long to have it to be a father than to be gone the whole time. And so if I put a trio together, now I would do it if it was big and I could go play festivals, you know? And um, yeah. And like I do, I do go out and do festivals around the world still with my trio, with Color Code. Um, I would do that, but it, it, to, to put the work in like Richie's doing with Billy, those guys are putting in the work, man. I mean, they're out there hitting it. They're working hard. And you and that's what you got to do to make it, right? Am I convinced I want to go out and play, you know, 200 dates a year? I don't know that I want to do that. I, you know what? I can totally respect that. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. That's why I developed television, you know. Because you're clearly very busy still. You you always have ten projects going on at any given time. Yeah. But they they have clearly shifted to different types of work. Yeah, yeah. It gets work that pays me. <laughs> you know, I got paid. I got paid a lot up until the early 2000s. I was overpaid for a guy who didn't sell. You know, maybe I sold two million albums around the world. I got paid like a guy who sold millions and millions of albums. I mean, I was really lucky. I had really good contracts. And uh, I was lucky that, you know, I was one of the few guys I know that had a recording contract for over 20 years where someone was always giving me a, a big advance. I was really lucky. And, and you know, I have to, uh, I'm father now. And, and plus, you know, developing television is exciting to me. I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, uh, it's, 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 I, you know, I get to work with all these talented and creative people like, you know, Greg Cabot from Seinfeld and you know, Adam Beach and, and, I, and I don't know what I'm doing. So therefore it's like a new and it's new territory. You know, I just developed a brand new, uh, signature model guitar though with Framus. That's cool. Tell me about that. Yeah. You go online and look, it's, the, it's called the idol maker. You know, I don't know if you know that, but I did American idol for four seasons too. That's where it gave me the television bug a little bit. Cause I saw the power of what television could do for music. And, um, that's when, so that's when I developed Arbor Live. And Canadian Idol, too, didn't you? Well, I wasn't on it, but I, I worked with Kalen Porter for a little bit, the guy who was like the biggest selling idol in Canada history, the biggest selling single. Yeah. Uh, I did that through Sass because Sass hooked me up with that. Now, as we wrap things up, tell me about the book that you have coming out in September. Well, the book is a memoir. Uh, it's about a dream come true, and it's about a story of about, a, about a, how a kid sort of became a man. Um, it became, it's a, uh, I learned so much from the Rod Stewart band, from Carmine Rojas. I mean, I had Carmine Rojas, I had his posters on my wall when I was in high school. You know, and next thing you know, I'm in a band with Carmine. And the reason I got the gig with Rod Stewart is because Carmine got me the gig because when I walked into audition, he said I reminded, of it, reminded him of his little brother who had died in his arms. And 
So this Rod Stewart thing was a huge turning point in my life. And a lot of people know, like, oh, Rod Stewart, whatever, he's a fucking this or that. And it's like, they don't get it. He was a huge rock star in 1988. You know, we played five times, five, six nights at, you know, Maple Leaf Gardens. You know, we did Madison Square Gardens, multiple nights sold out, you know. And I, what I learned from Jeff Golub and Carmine Rojas and Rod Stewart and, and the, the Rod Stewart band was how to be a pro. I was a little kid. I didn't know anything. I had a lot of gumption and a lot of energy. But those guys taught me a lot. And those are the same things, if you ask Taylor Hawkins, what I taught Taylor Hawkins. And, you know, Taylor wrote a blurb on the back of my book. I don't know if you saw it on my Facebook page the other day. And it said, if it wasn't for Stevie Sellis, I quite possibly could be delivering a pizza to your house tonight. You know, and that made me feel so proud because I rode Taylor Hawkins hard the same way the Rod Stewart band and Rod Stewart rode me hard to get me to a level I needed to be at. And, and uh, I think kids today aren't willing to put in that kind of pain and that kind of, that kind of work. You know, when, when, when Matt Sorm and I talk about this all the time, when we were young trying to make it, and this is in my book, because Matt's one of the first guys I met when I moved to L.A., um, you know, you had to work harder. You, there was one slot available, and there was a million guys trying to get it. You know what I mean? It was like you couldn't walk in all fat and out of shape. You couldn't walk in and not know your shit. You had to be better. You had to, and, and, you know, you, it's like, or, or have something like what Taylor had, or maybe what I had. I, I had this thing that Rod Stewart loved in me, or Lucy Collins loved in me, this youth that they think they can mold. But you had to be willing to be molded. And kids today are like, they were yelling at me. It's like, I do American Idol, and the kids that did the best were the ones that could take it. And the ones that all, you know, cried and crapped out. None of those guys are even in bands anymore. You know, they couldn't take it. It's because it's, it's not an easy business. You've got to have thick skin. You know, Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats, who is one of my dearest friends forever, he said, and Robbie Robertson said this to me too, they were, Slim said I was too stupid to realize that I wasn't good enough to make it. He, you know, he had to, he had to really think. And Robbie Robertson said, I just couldn't hear all the negative comments that I wasn't the guy that should be making it, you know? And it was the same thing, you know? I learned this from Rod Stewart, you know? You know, with those guys backing me and I did what they said and it was like, I, I came out of it with the confidence and the power, and, and Taylor Hawkins is a perfect example. And we talk about Taylor in my book a lot because Taylor, you know, Taylor is the ultimate success story. He's a kid who, you know, showed up, you know, in an audition, and I just saw magic in that kid. But man, he couldn't, he couldn't keep the tempo to save his life. But look at him now; he's in one of the biggest bands in the world, and, and it's just hard work, and it's just is is willing to listen to his elders and listen. Too. And, and my book's about that. My book's about becoming a man, being a boy and joining a band and becoming a man and it changed my life. And that's really what the book's about. And it's funny as hell. You know, we talk about 8 million girls and, you know, my bedroom, my hotel room with 10 naked chicks in it every night past that. You know, it's, it's a rock and roll story. And uh, Private Jets and Rod Stewart carving up Sting's airplane and, and uh, you know, and it's starting a world of Sting and, and uh, me playing football stadiums and not having a clue what I'm doing. You know, it's like... You know, I started, I started first cut at the deepest one night and my, on my second or my third gig of the tour. And I looked across the other end of Joe Robbie stadium in Miami and I saw, you know, 80 foot diamond vision myself on the diamond vision screen. And I just froze in my tracks and stopped playing. And, and Rob Stewart looked at me and I was like, Oh fuck, you know, 65,000 people out there. And I froze, you know, it's all the things that can happen when you're a kid and dressed into the situation. And then what do you do with it? And, and it's really a story about those guys became my, my big brothers and, and the love affair that we had with, with, with becoming successful and being, being like a, a like a, like a, a family of brothers and like, like a, like we were like an army and we came to towns and we, we, we tore the towns up. You know, we stole limousines and we did all these things that, you know, you don't, rock and roll bands don't do anymore, you know. It was the last of that era of that wild rock and roll supermodels and, and, and madness, you know. And there it is, a detailed look at the career of Stevie Salas. His book is available now for pre-order on Amazon. Now I'm going to go rest my voice, but I'll see you next Monday for the next episode of the Double Stop Podcast. Love song. Lullaby to my grave. Love